Friday. We're going to be talking about what the diet industry doesn't want you to know about. My guest is the star of the documentary called Beyond Weight Loss. Welcome, my good friend, nutritionist Keith Klein. Welcome, Keith. I know that you've developed many novel psychological tools. What motivates most people to lose weight? Fear. I can create fear for anybody. Oh, I've never seen anybody this heavy, you know? <laughs> and the doctor can say, hey. oh man. <laughs> That's not a bad thing sometimes. Now, the problem with fear is that fear is fading. Here's some real critical keys to massive success. Welcome to the Lee Labrada Show. Brought to you by Lean Body, the number one protein shake in gyms across America. Hey guys, and welcome back to the Lee Labrada Show, the podcast that helps you to improve your physical, mental, and spiritual health. My next guest has been on my podcast before, and I want to welcome him back so he can share some very interesting perspectives on a topic that you need to understand in order to achieve long-term fat loss success. If you've tried to lose fat and you have failed over and over, we're going to be talking about what you have to do so that this never happens to you again. We're going to be talking about what the diet industry doesn't want you to know about, and I'm referring to relapse prevention. We're going to be talking about some mind control habits to help you take control of your body in order to reach your best physical condition and stay in great shape. My guest is the star of the documentary called Beyond Weight Loss, which you'll find on Amazon Prime and YouTube. And he's been a sports and clinical nutritionist for over 40 years, author of several nutrition books, and the CEO of the Institute of Eating Management and Relapse Prevention Center right here in Houston, Texas. He's also a co-owner, along with me, in our online lean body coaching service, which has helped hundreds of people to get the fat off and keep it off. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my good friend, nutritionist Keith Klein. Welcome, Keith. Hey, Lee. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, man, I'll tell you what. It's uh, it's great to catch up with you. And always. It's always very, very interesting to talk about fat loss with you and to talk about relapse prevention. So I want to start with that. You know, I know that we discussed this briefly in one of our prior podcasts. Mm-hmm. But for those of us who haven't seen it or haven't heard of it before, can you tell us a little bit about what relapse prevention is and how it pertains to athletes and bodybuilders? Well, you know, Lee, how most people are familiar with it is from an alcohol or a drug aspect, right? You always hear about relapse prevention. Somebody goes through AA, somebody goes through a drug rehab program, and then what's following that program is relapse prevention. They're going to go out in the real world and try not to relapse. Mm -hmm. But with food, it's a dramatically different issue because with drugs and alcohol, you can give them up. You don't have to have them around. But when it comes to weight loss, you have to have food around. You're going to be in social settings and you're going to encounter triggers and things like that all revolving around food, a party, a celebration, whatever it is. And so relapse prevention really revolves around changing a person's mindset so that they see their behavior in a completely different way which instead of driving towards the behavior helps to drive them away from the behavior. The problem for a lot of people is they're never exposed to the psychological uh, ways in which we change behavior, right? You know, you hear the typical relapse revenge, oh, get a smaller plate, you know? Yeah, right, uh, right. You know, Eat less. Yeah, you know, all those typical things. Sure. Well, to me, relapse prevention really revolves around getting extremely creative on how you parallel their behaviors back to them, but in a different way, which then changes the behavior. Okay, so I know that you've developed um, many novel psychological tools, that's how I'm gonna describe them, okay. that help people to change their behavior and achieve fat loss. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna walk through some of those, okay. and, um, and I'm just going to uh, touch base on them, and then I want you to uh, let our, our viewers know, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, what your thoughts are on each one of these topics. Ready? Okay. Okay. So, um, let's talk about better, bad choices. Right. Okay. That's the one thing that when I run across people that I haven't seen in a long time, that they all seem to remember it, it can really help you change the way you approach bad foods. So many years ago, I worked with a psychiatrist named Dr. John Sims, and we worked together, uh, for eating disorders and, a little bit of obesity and weight loss, but mainly it was eating disorders. 
I had to figure out a way in which I could get these anorexics and bulimics moving back towards having control over bad foods instead of the foods having control over them, right? So we had to reverse that. They also developed a fear about food. So these eating disorders are very multidimensional. But my job was to teach them how to eat and give them the confidence that they weren't going to gain their weight back or that they weren't going to fall back into a relapse with their, their disorder. So, and this is huge with, with overweight people. So let, let me ask you this. So you actually learned about some of these psychological tools we're going to be talking about today with people that are actually facing the opposite problem, anorexics, you know, people that have uh, uh, trouble keeping weight on. Well, let me tell you something. It's, it, it, I learned more from my clients. You know, when you're practicing something for 40 years, um, I learned more from my clients than I ever did the books that I read, right? So they would say mm -hmm. something and you would have to find a creative way to bring it back to them. And that's sort of how Better Bad Choices came to be, right? Okay. The idea, and this is where a lot of people go horribly wrong. They think that to lose weight, they have to be perfect. And so they're willing in the beginning to give up all their favorite foods. Right. Well, how long can one do that? For, Not very right? long. So look, what would happen if, if you go into, let's say, a Bex and you normally order a hamburger and you discover, okay, there's 950 calories in this thing and so many grams of fat. But listen, what would be wrong with going in and ordering a kitty burger, which has 400 calories and far less fat? You satisfied the urge to eat the food. You made a better bad choice which also relinquishes you from the guilt that you feel from having the hamburger. And now you walk out with greater confidence because I did better. You made the decision to cut down your calories almost in half. Yeah, but it's almost not even noticeable because by the time they're done eating the, the kid's burger, it's filling, it's satisfying, and they had a hamburger. Now, I could take any food across the spectrum of foods and give you an illustration of how to make a better bad choice, even a root beer float. Okay. But see, what would a dieter do? Nope, can't have that. And that's going to lead to other problems, which we'll look at in a minute. Right. Well, what if you took a diet A&W root beer, put literally a scoop of light vanilla ice cream in the glass, a tall glass, poured it over it. It foams and fizzes just like the high fat one. Right. But instead of a 400 or 500 calorie root beer flow, you had a 100 calorie one. Right. See, now you took away the uh, the psychological problems that having the regular one would create. Right. Because, again, a dieter is going to say, I can't have that. And what, what eating management is all about, it's a gentler way to the process of weight loss. Because keep in mind, if you said to me, Keith, what is the number one thing that you think leads to success with weight loss? I'd say mindset. If you don't change the way you think about food and exercise, you're never going to change what you do with food and so exercise. True. Yeah, so the problem for most people is they come at losing weight in such an oddball, restrictive way. It's harsh, it's deprative, it's painful, it's omissive. But what if it became a pleasure to do? Something and, they look forward to. Yeah, see, which is what motivates people to continue, whereas right. strict uh, restrictions, rigid omissions and all that, that's not pleasure, right? right. That's painful. And that means you'll move away from that. That's right. But what if I could create a gentler way? Now, here's three things. And you may not think this, but the reality is, is that small changes, so long as they're sustainable, create massive results over the course of time. And that is a solid truth. So, for example, three ways to make a better bad choice. My first example was just saying make a more positive food selection. Right. You know, if you're going to go out and have a nice steak because you want to celebrate, you don't have to do it in an obese way and get a 16 ounce high fat, you know, steak. Why not get a six ounce steak? See, and, and just that little bit of difference, you're satisfied. You you satisfied the urge to eat something like that, but you cut back on the calories and fat so significantly you don't even know you're dieting. And, and that's the goal, really, of eating management is to move people out of the dieters mindset into the lifestyle management mindset. Right. Now, second way you make a better bad choice, don't do it as often. You know, if I'm eating things like red meat and fried food or drinking alcohol five days a week, well, how many days could I really have it and live with that? So if I'm doing that five days a week and I drop it to two, isn't that going to be better for me? Right. Specifically, though, when you couple it with the first one, making more positive food selections, those two things together, doing it less often, you get a much bigger effect in a shorter period of time. Right. So you're saying instead of eating fried foods and drinking alcohol five days a week, mm -hmm. maybe you're only doing it two days a week. Or one. And, and, what, and what so, you live with? so you don't feel as deprived. Yeah. 
And then the third way is in the quantity, as I was mentioning earlier. You know, so if you want, if you want to have a red meat, well, you know what? Don't do that 16 ounce T-bone, do a six. Right. So there's three gentler ways to help people drop their body fat without having to go through the rigidity, the pain of deprivation and all yes. that kind of stuff. And let's talk about that since you mentioned that. Let's talk about the psychology of deprivation because to me, I think that one of the success keys to dieting is not to feel deprived. What are your thoughts on this? Well, first of all, if you're a competitive bodybuilder, you understand what you're getting yourself into. Sure. And to get down to that extreme level of body fat, you automatically know that you're going to be experiencing some deprivation. Sure. That's just natural and sure. normal. But what, but what if um, you went into the process of self-change by understanding first and foremost what causes your relapse? So, for example, if you ask most people, why did you gain your weight back? The answer to that's going to be, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I, I got busy. Uh, you yeah. know, I, I, got, I got stressed, right? Yeah. yeah. I think the biggest problem for a lot of people is that when they've lost weight and they gained it back, what I would be doing as a clinician is I'd be first going back to what you did, how you went about it, and why did you fail, right? So you can discover a lot about a person, but they're just destined to repeat the past if they don't learn from it, right? Right. So what I noticed was this, and I, I would point this out to anybody trying to lose weight, because once you can see it laid out in this fashion, I get that, then I'm in a mood where my brain can start to change with things, right? So for example, the psychology of deprivation is a title that I gave to a paper. I wrote a psychological paper about what dieters encounter and how it's the opposite of what they think it is. They think doing this to themselves is going to get them to their end goal. I say doing this to yourself is actually going to stop you from getting to your goal. And here's how it goes. The first thing most people do in an effort to lose weight is they give up all their favorite foods. Right. All right. No more red meat, no more fried food, no more eating out. Right. Right. Deprivation. Yeah. Well, how long is that going to last? Now, they're motivated in the beginning so they can sustain it for a couple of weeks. Right. Now, after a couple of weeks, they're going to encounter cravings. Right. right. And the cravings can be hitting them in all different directions. So remember, to have a craving Maybe you're driving down the road, you weren't even thinking of Fritos, but a Frito Lay truck goes the other way and suddenly your brain locks <laughs> onto that, right? So these it's, cravings, it's a trigger. Yeah, yeah, these cravings start to intensify and build. Now, the first thing that person's going to do when they encounter the cravings because they express the goal to lose weight is to say, no, I can't have that. It's not on my diet. But see, you can't keep that up because the moment you encounter the trigger, which is a negative emotional state of some sort, an emotional stress or whatever, then they crater and they get into the food. Okay, now once they binge on the food, uh, there's an overwhelming sense of guilt because yes. they violated the very rules that they set out to follow, which was, I want to lose weight. That's right. Now the guilt, they'll begin to rationalize and justify it away by saying something like this. Well, I've blown it now, I might as well really blow it, so what the heck? And then off they go completely, even more, right? And so uh, then that's going to be followed by the vow. You know, I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to get back on track. Right. Now, what I just laid out, you can see where the problem really began. It began in the severity of deprivation. Right. The brain doesn't deal good with it. And if you look at past studies on um, people that were put in uh, concentration camps, a lot of them had very great difficulty with their weight because they when the food came to them, they would eat as much of it as they could get their hands on because they'd experienced that great deprivation. Right. So the first rule of thumb, you know, is what do we do mentally to, to not do that to ourselves? Well, that's what we were just talking about. You don't have to be deprived to lose weight. You have to do better sure. than what you normally do to lose it weight. It seems to me that it would take a great deal of introspection, you know, personal self-inventory to be able to step through those things. But you know, I, I agree with you that so much of dieting is psychological that I think that as dieters, we owe it to ourselves to break down our behavior mm -hmm. and and to analyze it. Right. You know, and just kind of kind of work backwards, you know. Well, that's what a good clinician's supposed to do, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I would be doing. So what I want to do first is I want to make the person aware that the approach that they've been using to lose weight is flawed from the very beginning. Right. So that I can open up their mind to the possibility that we can do it a different way. And it startles people to realize, well, look, I haven't been perfect and I'm down 20 pounds. 
See, well, that's yeah, that's, that's an eye opening experience. Right. And it, hap- it can happen all the time if you're approaching it the right way. Right. Balance is the key. Yeah. But not with strict, rigid deprivation and painful right. emissions and things like that. People are being unrealistic. Right. And therefore, when they encounter a situation that needs flexibility, they're sure. inflexible. And, you know, so so often in our pursuit of perfection, you know, whether it's in a diet or anything else, we lose our flexibility. We become regimented and i think that's counterproductive it can be regimented i I like the word because i think i would exchange that one out with discipline overly yeah you know because i think discipline is very beneficial it's very necessary but discipline doesn't have to be painful correct you know discipline is a uh, it involves a great deal of thought but you know the old definition of discipline is doing what's good for you even when you don't want to sure that's kind of a little bit of a pain in there but yes. it is true to get something you have to give up something exactly right? exactly you have to pay a little bit of the price don't you yeah. now you know speaking of which uh you and i had a conversation about a week ago and uh, and i was talking about how people journal these days you know they'll write down everything that they eat you know um and uh, you, you kind of startled me, you know, when you said that I don't tell people to keep a food diary. I tell people to keep a junk food <laughs> diary. Right. And I go, what? Mm-hmm. So what's what's up with that? OK, look, if you're doing all the right things and by the way, if that works for you, by all means, do it. Sure. Right? The, nothing's absolute here. But. What I prefer that my clients would do is instead of writing down all the things they were doing right, let's keep track of the things that you're not doing right so that we can start to see the pattern. Yes. One, we can identify what triggers affect you. Number two, we can see how often you're doing these things because a lot of people forget. You know, if you're just drinking two uh, regular sodas a day, you're drinking 140 packets of sugar a week. Sure. So, you know, one, we can see how often you do things. And then what I like to do is we, we add up at the end of the two weeks, we've weighed them and measured their body fat before we weighed and measured them. And now we can see why they didn't lose or why they only lost a half a pound. And now they can be connected to their choices and the outcome. Then what I'm going to say is, look, let's see now in the next two weeks, how many times you can shave this back and this back and not give it up, but let's just shave it back. Also in that equation is awareness. For example, I had a client, he's a good friend of ours, I won't mention his name. He really thought he was doing better by going into Chipotle and getting a chicken. And I don't know what it was called, Bricible or something. I don't know what that was called. And I said, well, let's look it up. It had way more fat than the beef bowl. Oh my gosh. And he thought he was doing better than the beef bowl. By choosing the chicken. And he thought it was only a seasoning thing. So then I said, well, let's look up the chicken breast, which was 10% fat versus 48% fat. He had been eating a 48% fat meal. The red meat meal was in the 30 percentiles. But if he had just said chicken breast, it's in the 10 percentiles. Interesting. So again, you have to. So what does that junk diary do? Well, it helps me become aware of how often I'm doing things. Right. It allows me to check in with my clinician to see, is this really a better bad choice or is it a worse, worse choice? Right. You know, right. Now, Keith, you know that um, when when we're too regimented, you know, um, and too strict on diets. Mm-hmm. I don't know about you, but there's been times where, you know, I'll just eat anything that's not nailed down. Right. You know, it, and people call it a binge. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, let's talk about the anatomy of a binge. What causes binging? You know, what leads up to that? Well, what I wanted to do in order to break this down so I could understand it better was I wanted to look at what are the steps that a person goes through when they experience a binge? Mm -hmm. Because when I was young and just getting started in the weight loss business, I really didn't understand what a binge could be for somebody. Now, I had an extremely obese patient and she came in and she was feeling guilty, bad, downtrodden because she said, well, I had a really bad binge. Now, for the first time, I asked her, well, let's go through that. When you say you had a binge, what did you eat? And she said, well, the first thing I did is I popped up popcorn in oil. I sprinkled it with sugar and poured whole milk over it and ate a big (laughs) bowl of that. And then she said, for lunch, I ordered two large pizzas with two large bottles of soda. Oh, my gosh. And I ate them both. She just went crazy. Yeah, well, this is, you know, this, I don't think a lot of people realize how bad it can get for some people. Right. Then she ate an entire package of double stuff, uh, double stuffed Oreos. Okay. I said, well, let me ask you something. What did, after eating all that food, how did you feel? Because I want somebody to get in touch with how does this make you feel, right? 
And she said she didn't leave bed for almost two days. She wow. felt so upset. So let, let's look at the anatomy of a binge, because the only way I can stop somebody from binging or change the outcome of the binge is by understanding the steps we take. So the first step, if you're going to have a binge, is a thought. You can't have a craving if you don't have a thought first. Right. So you, you, either, you have to think about it. You hear the ice cream truck going by, then you think of the food, then you salivate. Remember right. Pavlov's right. dog? That's the, that's the trigger. Okay. You see the ice cream truck, then you think of the ice cream, then you salivate. Right. right? So uh, uh, you smell the food, then you think of the food, then you salivate. So the first thing that begins in the anatomy of a binge is a thought. The second thing that begins then is the decision. Now the person makes the decision, I'm going to eat something. And they usually know precisely what it's going to be. Let's go out for Mexican food. Let's order a pizza. And this is the area that I can help change the outcome. Because if I can teach somebody to make better or bad choices, I'm changing the outcome of that decision, right? Now, the next step after a decision is action. And that's where they follow through. They eat the food they wanted to eat. Now, there's not much I can do about that once that step has taken place because it's done. Right. And then after the action comes the psychological hangover. The psychological right? hangover or the, being, being or the guilt. As I just discussed, the physical one. Yes. Right? So some right. people have a physical right. hangover and other people have the emotional one. And that's or where both. they feel guilt, remorse, yeah. right? Uh, like a failure. And then it's followed by the vow, which is to do better next time. Okay. You know? And so now look, when you look at that, there's only two places I can really change the outcome of that. Okay. The first one is in the thought. You're in control of your thoughts. Everybody is. Right. See, and this so is, how do you get your those thoughts out of your head? Well, you engage in something we call stop uh, thought stopping behavior. Okay. You can picture a stop sign and say, you know, I don't have to think about that right now. Okay. The key to overcoming that craving is to quit thinking about it. Right. Because how many times, look, you you got a pad of paper, you're at the office, you're writing things down. Well, while you're busy, you're not thinking of food, so you're not. You have no cravings whatsoever. The moment you put down the pen, you kick back, and now thoughts start to pop sure. in, and that's where it begins. Sure, so, sure. so engage, engage the mind, keep it busier? Yeah, that's one. But, you know, at the same time, I don't have to think about that right now. You have to redirect your thoughts over to something more proactive, like thinking about going to the gym later, okay. something else. Now, once you do that, I don't think a lot of people, when they hear that advice, believe it, but they come back and say, you know... I had no idea how, I don't know if the word placid would be right here, but how weak I've really been not paying attention to the power of that thought. Sure. And what I'm just basically doing is getting an awareness to begin that your thoughts are driving the craving. You don't have to go down that path. And you have to have management of those thoughts. Other, yeah. Otherwise, you're just letting yourself blow whichever the wind blows. Right. And the second thing is in the decision. And that's where you discuss better bad choices. What you can see is a lot of these ideas are sort of interconnected to another one of them, right? Better bad choice with anatomy of a binge and the psychology of deprivation and a better bad choice. So they're all sort of interconnected and they're all mind concepts, you know, think differently. No, no doubt. And there's so much behavior modification that goes into that. Heath, let me ask you about the process of self-change. Let's say that I want to change my okay. bad eating habits. You know, how do how do I start that process of self-change? Well, everybody does it, right? There's it not, and not just with food, it's with anything you want to change your career. And so this applies to almost anything you want to change. The first thing that starts uh, in the process of self-change is awareness. The person becomes acutely aware that what they've been doing is no longer working for them, right? And now that we become aware that I don't like the way I look, I don't like the way I'm fitting in my clothes, I don't like the way I feel, right? The awareness is the first step. But you got to know how many people are aware that they have an issue and they're never changing it. Or they, or they just feel they can't. Oh, they're talking about it for years, but right. not doing anything about it. So right. well, clearly, why, why is that? Why well, don't they clear, do something clearly about it? Clearly, awareness isn't enough to change anything. Okay. You have to move to the second stage. Okay. Is that pain? No, the second stage is contemplation. Okay. Now, remember, pain can be a great driver to move away from something, right? right. That's that psychology 101. Sure. We move towards pleasure and away from pain. Exactly. But here's the second step. Once the person becomes acutely aware that what they're doing isn't working, they move into a stage of contemplation. What's important about this stage, most people don't know it exists and they skip it. And that's a mistake. So what I'm going to do next is I have to contemplate, how is this going to fit into my life? You know, is my life going to be more fun or less fun when I do this working out and eating right? 
right? right? And so you have to have some contemplation towards how this is going to work within your life. Then you take in the third step, which you move into knowledge. See, a lot of people will skip that. They probably never read the diet book that they're following right now, right? They're just doing what they think they should do. But knowledge is really important because this is where it goes wrong for a lot of people. They take in the wrong knowledge. And when they do that, every step they take from there is going to result in failure. So what you want to do is seek out the people that have maybe the background, the credentials, the experience uh, to help give you the education you need to have to get there. That's why I'm a big believer in you know, the process of education. That's why we have lean body coaching. We're there sure. to help make you aware of these mistakes and decisions that you're making along the way. But uh, taking in the right knowledge is important. And then what do you do after you take in the knowledge? Well, that's where you move into action. The, the, the issue here, though, is most people feel like once they go into action mode, it should be over. And that's not real. There has to be real work put in. Well, the action and the work but really what happens, you should understand that on average, most people will move from the state of action back to contemplation three, four or five times before they finally end it. Mm-hmm. See, so how many times are you tooting along and you encounter a trigger of some sort you've never encountered before and you don't know how to handle it? So you lapse. Now, what that lapse is, it's, a, it's an opportunity to go back and think about how you should handle that issue. How can you get through it next time? whether it's you're traveling now where you weren't before or whatever. And then you finally fall into the final stage of change, which is identity. It's just a part of who you are and what you do, and you don't have to think about it much anymore. It's an internalization. It is. Now, think about this, Lee. I I know this is you and me. When I'm cooking and making my food, it doesn't take any energy, thought, or effort. I've been doing it for so long, it's sort of a mindless activity. Right. It doesn't feel like it's work to me. It's something I want to do. Going to the gym. The alarm goes off, right? We get up and we go to the gym. We don't think about it anymore because it's just part of who we are, what we do, and how we choose to express ourselves to the world around us. Sure. Now, here's another interesting thing about where people will relapse and fall back. The moment you start to think of any of this in the process of change as work Mm -hmm. is the moment you probably won't do it anymore. See, the brain doesn't move towards work with pleasure. Work is perceived as a stressor. Sure. So what happens is when the alarm goes off for you and me, there is no thought about staying in bed whatsoever. We turn the alarm off and we get out. What's happening to somebody else along the way is the moment they say, you know, I can make the work up out later after work. You start rationalizing. Rationalization and justification is, is all that really is, it's a, it's a way to get you to do what you really want to do anyway, right. stay in bed and sleep. Right, right, right. right? right. <laughs> so what ends up happening is, you know, the person makes small statements that they don't realize is the ending of it, right? Sure. I'll just make the work up out later after work. Yeah, that's what I'll do. They hit the snooze alarm and they never go. Right. So the, you see the power right in that one little instance. Just in that moment. Of how a thought can affect your behavior. Yes. And, and, and change the outcome and the trajectory of where you're going. So that ties into something I want to talk about. People that know what they need to do but don't do it. Let's talk about that example. Okay. You know, where <clears throat> alarm goes off mm-hmm. and you hit the snooze button. Okay. So when somebody says, I know what to do, I'm just not doing it, Mm -hmm. it's rooted in the pain pleasure principle of psychology 101, the idea that we move towards pleasure, things that we perceive to be pleasurable, and we move away from things that we perceive to be painful. Right. Now, it doesn't have to be like a a, a stab in your heart with a knife painful. Sure. Your brain just perceives it as work. So when somebody says, I know what to do, I'm just not doing it, what they're really saying is, You know, although I'm uncomfortable the way I look and feel, what you're telling me I have to do to change it is is worse, more painful. Right. See? And so when you hear statements, this is what a good counselor does, coach, whatever, is we listen to the statements that people are making to us. We stop the session and explain it to them and say, now, let's let's talk about this in a different way. You've got to quit saying that to yourself. So, you know, like the person sleeping in in the morning. The, the moment you said, well, I'll make the work up out later in the day. Yeah, that's what I'll do is the moment you were saying to yourself, I don't want to go to the gym. What you got to do is you got to slam that back door and the brain shut. Right. You're not allowed to think those things anymore because right. they're detrimental to the process of moving forward. Right. 
So let's talk about let's talk about some of the things that we can say to ourselves at those moments where we're tempted to hit the snooze button. You know, you and I have talked about this positive self-speak, you know, and being careful to avoid things like, I have to do this, I need to do this, and instead reframing and saying, I get to do this. Let's talk about that a little bit. All right, well, well let's just picture your life on a teeter-totter, okay? Oh, okay. On one end of the teeter-totter is the want-tos, on the other end of the teeter-totter is the have-tos. And so this is your daily life going up and down like this. Right. What goes wrong for a lot of people is they spend too much of their energy, focus, and time and attention on what they're doing wrong instead of what they're doing right. The moment you start focusing on what's wrong in your relationship, you're going to feel bad about your relationship. Right. So when your wife does something wrong and you get focused on that, it can perpetuate more and more until you hate each other, right? Mm -hmm. If you're not careful. Get, you're getting fixated. Yeah, but the point is, yeah. if you want to turn that relationship around, just ask yourself now, what is she doing right? And suddenly you start finding more of that, right? Right. Well, that's similar to people overusing the statement, I have to. I have to go to the gym. I have to work out. I have to cook my food. I have to carry my food. I have to go to work. I have to do the laundry. I have to go to the grocery store. Now, have-tos are perceived as work. Want-tos are perceived as pleasure. When people start attaching the word I have to to things they really don't have to do, the teeter-totter starts to go like this. Yes. And then what they will do is they will develop an excessive want-to to try to rebalance out the disequilibrium again, mm -hmm. like going out and eating, uh, not cooking your food, right? right? I want to do that. Yeah. Okay. Now, the amazing power of changing just those words and switching them around really does decrease stress levels. So when I wake up in the morning, I, I'm going to have an amazing day. I just you every, tell yourself that. I do every morning. Yeah, I, I wake do too. Up, Today's going to be a great day, <laughs> even if I'm half asleep right. and mm -hmm. and uh, thinking about it. But yeah. I put that thought in, in front of me. I can't wait to work out later today. Now, in the beginning and also on stressful days, that may not be how I'm really feeling, but I tell myself it is anyway. Exactly. Yeah. I That's, love that. Yeah. So what happens is people get into a language barrier where they're overusing a term that adds stress into their life as opposed to decrease it, such as the term I have to. That's right. Yeah. So That's right. I, you know what I have found, Keith, is that whenever I am faced with a task, if I reframe it and I tell myself I want to do this, that's right. And then my next question is, why do I want to do this? What mm -hmm. are the benefits I'm going to get out yes. from this? And then I'll start actually listing one, two, three benefits that I'm going to get out of this task I have to do. Yeah. And man, it's just like it just totally it just totally reframes you. you just, your perspective perspective changes. Yeah. When I'm walking down the street and somebody says, "Hey, how you doing today?" I say, "I'm too blessed to be depressed." You know, because I truly believe that. And, you know, that's where gratitude lies. That's right. And the more you can feel grateful for having your health, for being able. There's many people who would love to be in your shoes to go oh work out gosh. every day. Yeah. But for some reason in our brain, we perceive it as work. And if it's perceived yes. as work, it's not a want to. The brain accepts that as a have to. It yes. makes it more difficult. That's right. Keith, let's talk about how people get motivated. You know, and let's start with the definition of motivation. You know, and, you know, obviously people feed motivation in different ways, but what are some ways, uh, you know, some different levels of motivation? Well, first of all, reframing is a big one. Okay. Let me show you how I would motivate you if you were an overweight person. Let's say you're a female, you're 165 pounds and you don't want to be 165 pounds. You want to be 140. Right. When you hop up on the scale in front of me, the first thing you might blurt out is, Oh my God, I've never been this heavy. I'm so fat, right? Mm -hmm. Those are negatives. And remember, you don't want your brain ever going into the negative territory. You need to stay in the positive. Now, when I hear the narrative going on, when that person steps up on the scale and it's all negative, I will say something like, isn't that great? And they look at me like, what? what? Yeah, no. Look, you're 164 pounds. You're only five pounds away from the 150s. And when you're 159, you're only nine pounds away from the 140s. You can do this. This yeah. will be easy. So what I just did is I took your negative and I worked it around so that you can see the possibilities within it. Mm -hmm. Because when you're negative is all you're doing is putting stops to your ability to move forward. That's why I say the mindset is one of the biggest things, biggest assets that you have to change. Now, 
What I've noticed about motivation over the years is that there seems to be three different levels of motivation. And what I like to do with my clients is identify where they're at in the process of motivation because they need to understand, okay, you're at level one. Okay, I need to, let's find a way to get you to level two. Now here's mm -hmm. level one. It's called fear-based motivation. Okay, what motivates most people to lose weight? Fear. I'm fatter than I've ever been. I've never looked this bad in my life. I don't fit in my swimsuit. Oh my God, I got a class reunion. I'm afraid everybody's going to laugh at me at the mm -hmm. class reunion. That's Th right. Those kind of things. So fear. you see, fear yep. usually is the beginning motivator for most people. Not everybody, but that's step number one. The second stage, now remember, I can create fear for anybody, right? God, I've never seen anybody this heavy, you know? <laughs> and the doctor can say, <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> your, your, your cholesterol's through the roof. You're a type uh, 2 diabetic, right? So we, the clinicians have the ability to add to your fear. And that's not a bad thing sometimes. Okay. Now, the problem with fear is that fear is fading. Because once the client takes action, they, they resolve fear. Yes. Okay. So now let's say they're down eight pounds. Now what starts to happen? They're not as fat as they were feeling. Their clothes are fitting better. They get comfortable. And over time, the fear fades. And if fear is your only source of motivation, when you reach that stage, you go one of two places. You either go back and put the weight back on or you move into the second stage of motivation. The second stage of motivation is what I call feedback-based motivation. And I got to tell you, feedback-based motivation is a wonderful one and it can work for years. And I think that when I, I know when I started, the feedback motivation was incredibly strong. I wonder if it was for you. For sure. Yeah. So yeah. what happens? Um, when I was 120 pounds and six feet tall, girls just didn't notice me. When I started working out, girls started to notice me. The feedback I was getting is I was getting more dates, right? So I wanted to work out more. So the feedback, your clothes are fitting looser. The scale is going down. People are complimenting you on how you look. You're getting more dates. And that feedback can be incredibly strong. But here's the issue with this one. It can't last forever. So at some point, you're not going to lose any more weight. You can't get any more bigger and muscular than you are. You can't fit in any smaller clothes. The scale can't go down any further. As, that, as you move into that stage in the latter stages of it, you'll go one of two places. You'll either quit doing what you're doing because the feedback ended. Look, you know, if if I see a woman and I say once to her, man, you look amazing, you've lost weight. You think I'm going to say it over every time? She's going to think I'm hitting on her, right? Right. So right. feedback fades. And as the feedback fades, you either go back and you relapse and put your weight back on, or you move into the third level of motivation. This is the one that's fascinated me my entire career. And I've been doing this for over 40 years. And to this day, I still can't figure out how to place somebody in the third level. I've tried. I've I've, I, put, I can't put my finger on it because the third level is intrinsic. It's a desire within the individual for their own unique reasons on why they want to keep doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And that leads us back now, what we talked about earlier, to they don't have to think about anymore. They don't need the motivation. It, it just becomes part of them. Who they are and what Keith, they I do. I got to tell you, because I have been working out now for more than 45 years, mm -hmm. and I don't have to think about it. You I just, I have the desire to go into the gym. Mm -hmm. um, the, sure, there's days when I'm tired, you know, I'm human after all, you know, uh, but I will tell you that, um, that it's on, it's almost like it's on autopilot. It is. You know, it's on autopilot. Mm -hmm. It's just part of who I am. Well, this is the stage that we're trying to get everybody to, right? This is the third stage of motivation that is long lasting. It's a lifelong thing. Mm -hmm. I've met people that have lost 100 pounds and kept it off over 20 years. Because they keep going. Yeah. They and keep, then I've met other people that have lost factors. 100 pounds and gained back 110. Right. So here's the day it would end for you. The day that you had a major stressful event come up upon you where you don't have the time or, excuse me, you're physically prevented from working out mm -hmm. and your brain starts to accept that's the new reality. That's the danger zone. Sure. See, but it, look, you've been doing it 45 years. I'm in my late 60s. I've been training for 50 years. Maybe since I started when I was 15 or 16. So at the end of the day, see, it is just part of our psyche. That's right. And anybody who does anything long enough can get there. Right. But they just have to keep doing it. You know, Keith, it's, it's, it's so important, the, the continuity 
Um, you know, and, and it takes a while for people to develop that, mom, that momentum, that, uh, continuity, you know, the, the, um, persistent desire to do it. Okay. And I think that, I think that people, um, uh, can benefit from having a coach. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, and so I, I would like to just take a few minutes, you know, to talk mm. about lean body coaching. Okay. Yeah. Well, first of all, what it is, is everybody's trained by me. We have a staff of nutritionist and they're all trained in these techniques of weight loss. And we have, I think we have about 60 modules in there that are all videos of me talking directly to you. It's a six month course. You know, at the end of the day, I don't think I can change somebody in a week. You know, it's going to take time. It's a lifestyle change. Well, yeah, because you have to give the person enough time to encounter the high risk situations that they would encounter in the real world and then have feedback from a coach who can show them how to deal with it in ways which they may not even know exist. Right. You know, it's really inexpensive. I mean, what would you pay to have a coach? And I, I'm not a salesperson here, but look, it's I think it's like $250 a month for the six months. You can pay by the month. People will go out and spend easily that on two meals at a high end restaurant. Oh, easily. You know? Yeah. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's, that's some people's coffee budget. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, what are you willing to pay for somebody to have that kind of quality coaching in your corner? See, mm -hmm. that's what it's about. So that's what we well, put and together. I, I like to look at it from the standpoint that it's it's not it's not even just what you're paying for the service. It's you're paying for the benefit. You know, how many mm -hmm. times do we uh, attempt to lose body fat and keep it off? That's the key right. because you teach people how to keep it off. Well, you know, and, of, and so what, what is that worth to somebody? You know? Well, you're much more prone to keep it off at the end of, of working on it for six months than you can doing it for a month and giving up, right? right. So at the end of the day, um, we really put this together so people could have access to quality, nutritional health and wellness, because it's not just about weight loss. It's about weight loss, health, and longevity. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it has to do with the mental changes that we talked about today you know being coached to psychologically overcome the issues that have right. stopped them in the past yeah and also what i've noticed about uh and when i say obesity i could just as well be saying an overweight state the first step that i see the first group of people in overweight states their problem is due to a lack of awareness they really don't know what they don't know about sure. putting together the right meal pattern. Right. They don't understand what the labels are, how they're tricking. Because how painful is it to be eating a diet that you think is so good mm -hmm. and only to learn later that it is causing you to gain weight? That's right. And there's a difference between a food that's healthy versus one that gets you lean. Mm -hmm. So look, if you ate an avocado, you're healthy. But you're taking in 28 grams of fat, which is far more fat than your body can burn at one sitting, right? right? So now you're gaining weight, even though you didn't overeat in calories. Mm -hmm. So it's about the caloric distribution. The coaches, we make it simple. You know, I'm not, and that's the key to it is, you know, is to let's get this into your lifestyle. Let's try it. But here's some real critical keys to massive success. I will watch people fight and defend They'll express the conscious decision that they really want to lose weight. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they'll fight and defend their position to stay overweight. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me share with you like that. Why do people get defensive like that? Well, I, it's more of an unconscious thing. It's a wall. When I come up against a client who's putting up a wall, yes. that is the point of resistance that we need to focus in on. Right, right. right. So here, let me explain what I, what I just said. I said that people express the conscious decision, this decision to lose weight, while at the same time, maybe unconsciously putting up walls, which will stop them from losing weight. And this is how a simple one. I'll say to somebody, listen to me, if you just cook and carry your own food, your problem's gone. Oh, I can't do that. I don't know. I don't cook. Right? So they, they tell you they want to lose weight. But when you give them the factual basis of how to do it, their wall comes up. Can't do that. I don't have time. I don't cook. Uh, you know, well, those are all things we can learn to do. I cooked and carried my food. Now I'm retired, right? So I'm, I'm basically around the house most of the time. So I cook my own meals there. You're still working. You carry food. Every time I've come out here, you've got your food with you. That's right. And look at the amazing shape you're in. Thank you. But once again, we got to that place with cooking and carrying our food to be a want to, not a have to. And because why do I want to do that? I want to look good. You know, I, I, we'll be 70 in 
for, I don't know about you, but just a, a few years will be 70. I don't want to go into my 70s debilitated, you know, unable to function or go on vacation. So you see, I want to cook and carry my food so that I can benefit that way, right? I'll be more structurally sound. I'll have more muscle at my age or what, any energy. Those are your goals. And yeah. you're, you're starting with the end of mind and working back. Yeah, well, you know what, I'll tell you, and this is sort of like that process of self-change. And I hope nobody takes offense to this. When I was young, as I mentioned earlier, my purpose and reason for working out was what I called the three W's of life. Women, weights, and wine. Okay? <laughs> I'm going to preface that by saying it shouldn't be confused with overweight women that wine. Okay. But that's what motivated me. I was getting dates. Okay. Now, that motivation went away pretty quickly when I got married and I met my wife. That no longer mattered to me. Then what happened was it moved into competition. I really wanted to be the best at my ability to compete. Uh, I won titles and, it, you know, that's what motivated me for a certain number of years. As I got older, you know, the idea of competing anymore has no appeal to me whatsoever. It just doesn't. If you said, Keith, I'll pay you $500,000 to go to the Masters Mr. America in six months, I, I, wouldn't even, I wouldn't even consider it. Because, you see, I don't require that kind of self-adulation anymore, right? Today, what motivates me to do what I do is strictly longevity and quality of life. Now, if I continue, like a lot of people, I want to be my high school weight. I want to be my high school weight. I, I can't go back and be motivated by the three W's of life anymore, sure. right? So as we go through life and as we age, there are different stages of fitness that we also go through. And so I've reached that place now where nobody, my, my mom died at 59. My father died at 32. My grandparents died when they were young. I mean, Truly, we don't have great longevity genes. They all died of heart attacks and strokes. I'm the first one really to make it to 66, 67. None of them did that. Congratulations. Yeah. And, you're, and you're very healthy. Yeah. Well, I'd like to think so. And the reality is, is that that is a result of me not having to exercise and carry my food. It's all the result of I wanted to get here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's uh, such great points. And yeah. so inspirational. Keith, let me ask you, where can people... Find out more about Keith Klein. They can just Google my name, K-L-E-I-N, like Calvin Klein, but also at eatingmanagement.com, just like you're eating food, management.com or leanbodycoaching.com. Okay. okay. One of those two places. Okay. That's that's great. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, Keith, any any parting words, anything you want to share with our, our well, viewers today? You know, Bruce Lee once said, use what's useful, right? Yes. And I would like to tell anybody out there, if there's anything that we said today that they feel is useful, take it and make it your own, you know, use it. And uh, I just like to see people for the first time making the changes that we've been espousing for so many years and find the pleasure in it as opposed to the pain in it. This is so good, yeah. man, brother. I'm so, so glad that you joined us today. Thanks. There you have it from the man himself. And guys, be sure to hit the subscribe button. If you enjoyed this, share it with a friend. Leave your comments and feedback below. All right, you guys, stay motivated. Get up and look up and God bless you. The Lee Labrada Show. Voices in my head imprison me. Wanna hold